We pride ourselves here in Georgia. We talk about the good things we produce, and we talk about our crops. We talk about our hams, and we talk about our vegetables. But it is a sorrowful thing to me that we have neglected one of the greatest things we've produced, namely one of the nation's really great poets, Byron Herbert Reese. His books of poems, uh, they're written right out of the soil and the sky and the lives of people in the mountains. I hope each of you will make the acquaintance of Byron Herbert Reese, the North Georgia young man who has become and is one of our country's greatest poets. He had sinewy arms and he had calloused hands, calluses all over him. They were just like leather. This was a working man. He knew what it was to work in those fields. He had on overalls just like my daddy and he had on work boots just like my daddy. And he had a sunburned neck, just like my daddy. And the girls liked him. And they'd come to me oftentimes and say, can't you get it, him to turn his head toward me sometime? <laughs> Talk to me. Oh, we had fun about that. Yeah, I was no, born I was, in Choice Story. He was born, born in Choice Story, and so was I. About uh, two and a half miles up the road here. I never dreamed that he was as intelligent as he was until I got in college with him and we took some courses together at Young Nairs College. He was a genius in my mind. We were mountaineers, solid to the roots. And I think he was certainly the greatest poet to come out of Appalachia. He grew bucks and potatoes. He grew books and potatoes. Absolutely authentic. Byron uh, Hub Reese would have been known in that community as that mountain boy who writes something somewhere sometime. Since there is little to tell about myself, here are some facts about my life. I was born in 1917 on a farm in North Georgia. The district in which I was born is Choe Stoe, derived from Cherokee Indian language. It means the dance of the rabbits. I still live on a farm and only a mile from the one on which I was born. I live between Blood Mountain and Enota Bald, the two highest peaks in Georgia. We were quite isolated then. When I started the school, I walked seven miles there and back each day. I can remember very well when my father used to haul pork to Gainesville, 50 miles away, in covered wagon. He required four days to make the trip. I didn't consider us as Appalachia. We are just mountain people. This area was pretty well isolated at that period of time. It was isolated because there's no communications with outside world, you know, other than locally. I think Byron Herbert Reese hit it right on the nail head about how we are. This is from Byron Herbert Reese's poem, Choice Story. We're not so much of the hills as living in them. Our likes are those of folks in Philadelphia. We read the books from New York, Paris, London. Old Henry Ford has set our feet to itching for far off places. Still, we're different. There was a resistance to change and adaptation, but at the same time, there was an embracing of it. Well, uh, electricity was put in here in 1938. Uh, it changed tremendously. The first telephones we had were the crank-up kind that every neighbor on the line listened in to your conversation. And my neighbors, they had a battery-powered radio uh, lived right up there next to me. And I'd go down there on Saturday night and listen to the Grand Ole Opera. That was a treat. I could hear three or four symphonies a week over WQXR, 
depending on the state of weather. There's a vast difference between live and canned music, but I believe I enjoy the latter more in private. It's very nearly impossible for me to keep still when I am listening to music. The first time I ever heard Haydn's number 102 in B-flat, I bawled. That would be a rather embarrassing thing to do in public. Music always meant so much to him, and he could hear things in it. When his father sold the hogs and he bought the coffee and the flour, and one day he came back with a phonograph and some classical records. And after that, always, when there was a dollar left over, another record was brought for that Victrola. One of the things that influenced this man very much was that mother. He had learned to read at his mother's knee. And she would have read the Bible and she would have talked to him about it. And he grew up loving the sound of that, uh, well, it was King James English. He loved words. And he was interested in old hymns and, and old ballads and people who wrote old ballads. No silver or gold, nothing satisfies me but your soul. At Younghurst, there was a fine young professor of American literature named William Lufkin Dance. Dr. Lufkin Dance was a great believer in writing and literature. He had gathered around him a bunch of boys who liked to write. We met at his cabin on Sunday evening and had our literary session. This group named itself the Quill Club. Byron Reese was almost immediately a member of our group. I don't think Hub had the confidence that he had had and needed until he came under the mentorship of Dean Lufkin Dance. In 1935, I couldn't raise enough money to go to college, so I stayed on the farm until 1938. The president of Young Harris gave me a three-month scholarship. Working your way through school isn't as noble as it is generally cracked up to be. I finished two years, but I didn't take a diploma because I avoided math and flunked a course in French. I taught in a rural school for two years. I hated it thoroughly. Since the spring of 1942, I've been farming. The farm, I'd say, was maybe 20 acres. It was bottom land that went along the Wolf Creek there, and it was rich, black, fertile land. Back then, 80 or 85 percent of the people farm. Now, I doubt if it's over 10 percent in the county. It was hand-to-mouth farming. It was make do or do without. They'd bring corn or chicken to eggs or something, and they'd trade it up in groceries, and, or most of it. Sometimes I might give them a few pennies or something, another <laughs> dollar or two. <laughs> the world here is so astonishingly beautiful, one can hardly bear to look at it. The autumn landscapes positively undo me at times. I get the same reaction to them as to great music. He loved the land, and he, he, he loved the meaning in the land, as very few people do understand it. And I feel that this makes Reese one of the truly original and authentic writers. There's nothing artificial about Reese at all. He was a, a mountain farmer. It was all reality to him, but spoken of with such beautiful language and with such a reverence for the world in which he lived that uh, to, to hype it would have been the, a sin. It would have been an abomination. He never hyped. He, he was real. And, and his work just shows that. Every poem along the road to wander he actually was riding to wander when he saw the peach and thought the bud was stained with blood. Um, 
Everything is so real. What more can I say? Reese was asked one time by someone that uh, he could get someone else to plant his potatoes so that he could write more. And he said, uh, someone else could plant them, but I'm the only one who holds them. And this struggle of a subsistence and his writing between the two was always a kind of uh, conflict with Reese. I get pretty well frustrated between writing and farming. Both make too many demands on your energy and time. At the moment, I'm in a sweat between the need to be utilizing the time I have free for writing and the disinclination to write. I am always torn between two loyalties, one to go on making my bread on the farm and the other to get out of my system those things I want to comment on through writing. If I could ever earn a living through writing what I want to write, I'd be free and as happy as any mortal can expect to be. Later, when I became acquainted with his poetry, I saw that he was looking at life and true life in a way and in, in, a, in a depth that I rarely see it among writers. And uh, there was this quality of Reese's understanding both life and death. Uh, in a way that I felt was, uh, if not unique, certainly profound, and something which is shared by only a few other uh, poets of America, I think, maybe Emily Dickinson, among others. Greece had a way of going to the heart of a matter in a very moving, lyrical way, like the little poem, uh, Boy and Deer. I mean, that's, that's the perfect situation there. Each eyeing each with mild surprise and each with wonder in his eyes. You don't just kill a deer when you see it. You both realize that you're on the same earth together. And that quality, of course, is always there in Reese. May I say that the acceptance of my collection by E.P. Dutton and Company is the most important thing that has happened to me since September 14th 1917, when I first beheld the light of day. They put together that first collection, Ballad of the Bones and other poems, and then Jesse Stewart, whose books had all been published by E.P. Dutton in New York, he gave Reese's book to E.P. Dutton and recommended that they should publish it. So. It was E.P. Dutton that took care of, of publishing Reese. Mr. Dutton elected to come and see Reese in his home and where he lived. Sure to God, Reese was shocked when Mr. E.P. Dutton says, I'm E.P. Dutton, and knocked on his door. You know, he must have just been shocked out and back, I would think. He had wonderful reviews, wonderful reviews. He was part of another generation of writers. He was part of a generation of writers who believed in a well-crafted sonnet and a well-crafted quatrain. And the new world was beginning, the avant-garde. There was that whole California beat group out there. And where did Byron Reese come from? Choice Toy, North Georgia. Who are you? He wanted to be writing. To be able to make a living from his writing, that, that bothered him terribly. It, it bothered him terribly. He was very ill. Uh, and when he was ill, he didn't want to see anyone. Tuberculosis seemed to affect the Reese family in that they knew what they had. They knew it was contagious. They knew that it was killing people. The poem, There Never Was Time, is reminiscent of Byron's awareness that his lifespan was going to be shorter than that of his friends and many family members. But now the night that has no breaking shadows the sun, 
gone down the west, and my heart in its damaged cage is aching after lost years, too brief at best. I know a journey that still wants going. I know a song that is still to sing. I know a fallow that waits the sowing. There never was time for everything. That is a heartbreaker. He knew there wasn't the time. With the riding and the press of the farm, we simply got to dig our potatoes before they rot in the ground. I am run ragged. Well, I've just reached my wall. I've reached the absolute limit of my energy. I couldn't do more than I'm doing if my life depended on it. Success and I just miss connections somewhere along the line. Well, to hell with it. I've got to eat. I don't like to be hungry. So I'll meet my English classes as long as I can. I am discouraged by the lack of a public large enough to mean anything financially. Once I could ride and earn my living at something else, but I don't have that kind of energy anymore. I'm tired. I'm through. I quit. Wherever there is an ear waiting for music, wherever there is someone hungry to see the mountains, they can pick up his book and they can see it there and they can hear the music if they want to. Poets are a dime a dozen. Bad poets are a dime a dozen. Reese is beyond price. He put a whole landscape into a book, into four volumes of poetry and two novels. There is a landscape for us to revisit. Byron, of what value to society is the writer? All good uh, literature is uh, a mirror of reality. And man can look into this mirror and see himself and know what he looks like. The Appalachian ethos still exists in Byron's work and in the work of a few other people, I hope. But music I heard when I went forth to plow. I mean, you know how many people go plowing now, but if they do, they understand the music that he heard. Would you be interested in creating something that uh, will stand after you're gone? Yes, uh, I think all mortal men would like to think they have left something immortal behind them. Oh, you know, you can just you hear him talk. You could just dream, see how he was just dreaming, seemingly like hearing him come up, just like he's being talked to. Well, I don't think the communities has ever given him credit being as important a person as he was, you know what I mean? And I think that's wonderful that he is getting some, some recognition. recognition now. And I... He deserved it. Byron, what is your hope as a writer? To express as much reality as uh, I can grasp. I'm not particularly interested in fame. It doesn't uh, matter to me whether I'm famous or not. I can't think of anybody, anybody, anybody who wouldn't react to this poem. I saw a fallen sparrow dead upon the grass and mused to see how narrow the wing that bore it was. By what unlucky chance the bird had come to settle, lopsided near the fence in sword, grass, and nettle. I had no means to know, but this I minded well, whose eye was on the sparrows shifted, and it fell.
I know a valley green with corn Where Nodley's waters roll and run From the deep hills where first at morn It takes the color of the sun And bears it burning through the shade Of birch and willow till it's tied Pours like a pulse and never stayed Dark where the gulf's edge reaches wide there while the twilight spends its dream of light and shadow both the word of bats and cries of doves will seem a very liveness of the air about a house the ivy's foot creeps slowly up to hide the eaves and wreath the chimney dark with soot into a colonnade of leaves and one will loiter in the yard, soft shadowed by the last of day, as if she waited for a word from lips three thousand miles away. That yearned to speak against her hair, but dumb behind the palm of space, taught to trembling while there, darkness obliterates her face. poet Byron Herbert Reese. He was born near Blairsville, Georgia. He lives there now. He was born in a house where his mother had been born. It was a house built at the time when there were Indians, the Cherokees, and at a time when they were being removed. I visited Byron there. And I remember sitting in a corner, an old Sharps rifle, such as the West knew. Byron's people, uh, a real pioneer. Byron grew up there, and Byron has taught to young Harris College. His health isn't good. He had tuberculosis, and yet he has produced four volumes of poetry and one novel. He has another novel to come out sometime this year.